Okay, let's continue with some simple facts about eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Let's start with the following. 2.25, let k from x to x, compact and as usual Axel Hilbert space. No, we don't, no, no, excuse me. Uh, we here we allow that x is Banach. Uh, then we have that the dimension of the kernel of i minus k is smaller than infinity. Proof. Assume that dimension of the kernel is infinite, then uh, as in Ries lemma, construct a sequence construct a sequence UK uh, in the kernel of I, in the kernel of i minus k, such that the norm of u k is equal to one, and the distance between two uh, different elements of u is larger or equal to one half for k not equal to l. And of course, that means UK is bounded, but uh, UK has no convergent subsequence. Uh, now, let UK bounded. Uh, UK is bounded. K and, uh, and everything is in the kernel of I minus K, which means that K UK is equal to UK, and this has no convergent subsequence. And since UK was bounded, the norm of UK was one, we have contradiction to the fact that K is compact. So uh, the assumption was wrong and the dimension of the kernel must be infinite. Um, the application to eigenvectors is the following with the same conditions as above, corollary. If lambda not equal to zero is an eigenvalue of K, uh, then the eigenspace, so the um, set of all vectors with Ax equals lambda times x, uh, has finite dimension. Well, why is that the case? The eigenspace is the same as the kernel of lambda i minus k. Now, if lambda is not equal to zero, then this is the same as uh, the kernel of i minus one over lambda times k. And since k is compact, one over lambda k is also compact. And so this has finite dimension. Okay. Um, Next, let's talk a little bit about self-adjoint operators. So, uh, 2.27. Uh, K, and this time again from a Hilbert space to a Hilbert space, 
self-adjoint if and only if k is equal to k adjoint. Okay, um, this is a definition that's very well known from linear algebra, and uh, there you prove some things, and we will use them here too. So I remind you, 2.28 lemma. Um, first, I always restrict myself to uh, real uh, vector spaces, but um, of course with eigenvalues, we might have complex eigenvalues. So uh, the question is, if I extend everything to complex values, then uh, what happens? Well, uh, at least we don't get complex eigenvalues of self-adjoint operators. Um, and even over the complex numbers, I, the eigenvalues of self-adjoint operators are real even if I continue everything in the complex, to the complex numbers. And the second is, um, if KUN, uh, let me have those just, let KUN equal lambda one UN. So U1 is uh, an eigenvector, uh, with respect to the eigenvalue lambda one, and of course u one should not be equal to zero. K u two equal to lambda two times u two, and uh, assume that lambda one is not equal to lambda two. So u one and u two are eigenvectors of k with um, respect to different eigenvalues. Then we have that u one and u two are orthogonal, and uh, of course that applies only again only if the case is self-adjoint. Okay, the proof is an exact copy of finite dimensions. So in, in, in the proof, you don't make use of finite dimensions. So the usual proof is um, for one, let KU equal to lambda U, U not equal to zero. Then uh, we have that uh, lambda times u and u, and if, since u is not zero, u uh, scalar product with u, norm u squared is not zero. So this is the same as lambda u times u, which is the same as k u, u. And since everything is self-adjoint, since k is self-adjoint, we have this is u of k star u, but k star is k. And uh, well, this is the same as, um, yeah, let me continue here, u of lambda times u. And this is, when I go into the complex numbers, then this is the same as a lambda, a lambda complex conjugate times u and u. And if lambda is not equal to lambda, uh, lambda, um, yeah, assuming that uh, um, um, I divide by the norm of u squared, and we have that lambda is lambda complex conjugate. Okay, now second thing. Um, in the setting above, same thing as, uh, as with one, I look at lambda one times u one and u two, and uh, this is the same as k u1 and u2. Now, since this is self-adjoint, this is the same as u1 and k u2, and this is the same as u1 and lambda u2, which is the same as lambda time lambda 2, which is the same as lambda 2 times u1 and u2, and now if lambda 1 and lambda 2 are not equal, then uh, 
there's only one chance. The scalar product of u1 and u2 must be zero. Okay, um, so um, that's very uh, known stuff. Uh, something a little bit more interesting, which is absolutely not interesting in finite dimensions, although there is an equivalence. Um, theorem 2.29. Let K a compact self adjoint operator. And again, from Hilbert space X to Hilbert space X. Uh, then, either lambda equals to norm K or lambda equals to minus norm K is an eigenvalue of K. Now, uh, and the additional thing is um, uh, the, the uh, absolute value of lambda, which is nothing but the norm of k. Oh, let me write it this way. Uh, norm of k is larger or equal to the absolute value of mu for all eigenvalues of k. So k does not only have that, opera, have that eigenvalue norm of k, it's also the largest eigenvalue of the operator. And uh, if you think back uh, to, for example, numerical linear algebra, then uh, there's also the proof that for a self-adjoint operator, and that would then be um, a symmetric uh, matrix, uh, the norm of that is given by the maximum by the maximal eigenvalue and the um, the absolute value of the maximal eigenvalue, and uh, that's exactly what we have here. Okay, uh, so the proof is a little bit more interesting. Well, uh, first of all, let me remind you what uh, how the norm was defined. We have that the norm of K is the soup over all u um, not equal to zero, norm of k u over norm u, and uh, this is equivalent to, and we'll use both uh, definitions, I believe, uh, u norm u equals to one, of course u in x for both norm of k u. Now, um, assume that um, mu is uh, an eigenvalue of k, then there is a v not equal to zero, such that kv is equal to mu times v. And uh, that means that uh, the norm of kv over v, well, that's nothing but uh, mu um, absolute value of mu times norm of v over norm of v, v, so that's the absolute value of mu. And on the other hand, uh, the left-hand side is bounded by the norm of k. So uh, the remark that I made is clear. The norm of k is uh, small, greater or equal to uh, um, the absolute value of mu for all eigenvalues mu of k. Okay, uh, so that was simple. And um, the interesting one is the other one. So uh, norm of k is the soup of all norm u equals to 1 k u. That means that uh, we can find a sequence un 
with the properties that the norm of un is equal to one and the norm of KUN converges to the norm of K. Um, now let's look at the following norm. K square UN minus the norm of KUN squared UN and again squared. Don't ask me how you get to, um, what's the idea behind that? There is actually an idea behind that, but uh, we'll just look at this. Uh, we'll just uh, drop, drop this in, in here. Okay, so definitely this is uh, larger or equal to zero. Now um, let's look at what that actually is. So we take it apart. So again, like before, we first have norm of k squared un squared. Um, then we have twice the norm of KUN squared. That's this term over here. And uh, then uh, we have the mixed scalar product. So that's K squared UN scalar product with UN, and uh, um, then we have the norm uh, of the uh, uh, second part of the sum squared. So this is the norm of K UN squared, squared again, so that's to the four. And then we have norm of UN squared, and that's one because all the UN have norm one, so that's what it is. Okay, so k square un, un, let's look at the scalar product. Uh, now, since k is k itself a joint, we can throw the k over. And so this is nothing but k un, k un, which again is k norm, uh, k un norm squared. So what we have here is exactly the same as the norm of k squared un squared minus the norm of KUN to the four, right? Because KUN, KUN is also KUN's, norm of KUN squared. Okay, um, now let's look at this. Um, um, yeah, the first part is uh, K, uh, K square UN is K times KUN. So if I take one K out, I find that this over here is uh, small or equal to norm of k times k u n. So that's norm k squared times the norm of k u n. And minus norm of k u n to the four. Now, what happens if I take uh, the limit for n to infinity, k norm of k u n um, converges to the norm of k. Um, again, this convert, oh, this is a square, I'm sorry. Uh, and this converges to the norm of k square. So we have norm uh, norm of k to the four minus norm of k to the four. So that converges to zero. Okay, so we find that the this norm converges to zero and uh, later we'll insert something here. Okay, um, next we find that uh, since K is compact, yeah. K is compact. So uh, we also have that K square is compact. That's something we proved. Um, so, um, UN is uh, uh, bounded, is bounded because its norm is one. 
So K square has a, um, um, a convergent subsequent. And without loss of generality, we assume that K square UN is that subsequence. So K square UN is convergent. And we assume that it converges against some G. And um, for convenience, I multiply this with a norm squared. OK. Um, now let's look at the following. The norm uh, of k square. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, let's now take uh, the formula in pink, which we have over there, and. Uh, Let's look at what happens if we let n tend to infinity. Then uh, the left-hand side goes to k square un, uh, k square un, uh, so that goes to g, k square g. Then we have, uh, well, we have the norm of K un, K un converges towards norm of K squared. And uh, then we have that un. And we have that this converges to zero for n to infinity. Okay, so there's uh, only one thing left. We, uh, we, uh, un is convergent and un converges to g. Now we have that k square g. Now k square is a compact operator, uh, so it is uh, continuous, which means that this is the, lim the uh, limiting value of k square un. Now, uh, but uh, this converges to the norm of k square, or this is the norm of k square times g. Yeah, right, because uh, we ah, that's, we had assumed this at this place. Okay, um, so we find that k square g is the same as norm of k square times g, or uh, norm of uh, k square is an eigenvalue of, um, of k square. And uh, by the way, g cannot be zero because uh, the norm of all the UNs was one. Okay, um, so this is not really what we wanted to prove, but there's only one step left. Let's look at the operator, k minus norm of k times the identity operator, k plus norm k, times the identity operator and apply that to G. Now, uh, this is exactly the same as K square G minus norm of K square G due to the uh, binomial formula. Formula, So uh, this is zero. This is what I stated above. Now, what does that mean? Well, there are two choices. Either if uh, this is zero, Then it means that G is an eigenvector of K for the eigenvalue minus norm K. On the other hand, um, if this is not zero, then the whole thing is an eigenvector 
of k for the eigenvalue norm of k. And uh, so that's exactly what we wanted to prove. Either norm k or minus norm k is an eigenvalue, and that will prove to be very useful.